All right, hello to everyone that's joining. Uh, we'll get started here in just a moment as people enter into the, uh, the webinar room here. Hope you're all doing well and having a good week so far. Today's webinar, we will be covering the 17 key traits of data literacy. And so uh, we want this uh, to be an interactive session. So you can see a Q&A panel up at the top. Feel free to put your questions in there as we go along. In fact, if someone who's on already wouldn't mind and just type something in there and say hello, I just want to make sure it's all set up and ready and working. <laughs> cool. Hello, everyone. That's awesome. That's coming through the chat, which is awesome. And some people are coming through the Q&A. So notice there's two little icons up there. One says chat and one says q and I'll keep them both live so you can feel free to use either one. Hey, Sean. Hey, Maureen. Hey, Sanjay. Thank you, Jody. Nice Q&A. <laughs> and Natalie, there you are. How are you doing? There's Diana. Jacob found the buttons. <laughs> Pretty cool. Hi, Vanessa. And hey, Rami. Good to see you there. And Jordan. Wow. All right. Great. Glad you could be here, too. There's Anna. Hey, Anna. Mr. Murphy dialing in from Australia way too early. What time is it, David? What time is it? Uh, Bonnie, I'm using, what is this microphone? Samson G something Pro? I don't know. Is it working? Is the sound okay? Is there a lot of background noise? Or does it sound nice and clear? Oh, good. Awesome. Yeah, I just had this literally shipped this morning <laughs> from Amazon. So good. Awesome. Okay. Well, you know, we've got a good group already on the webinar. So let's start right here. So welcome, everyone. It's uh, this, this first webinar here of the, um, of the year and really ever for data literacy. So this is our, our number one first webinar and we're real excited to publish this ebook, The 17 Key Traits of Data Literacy. I think you all saw that. I shouldn't say the, by the way, I shouldn't say the 17. I, I don't know, I wouldn't be so bold as to claim that these are the only 17. I think that these are 17 that, um, that I definitely feel uh, strongly about and I think you probably uh, are gonna have a few yourself too that maybe you think you'd add to the list. So where this came from is you know, we, we saw that people started using this phrase over the last maybe couple of years. And, and it almost always begs the question, what does that mean? You know, it's, it's a metaphor um, to literacy. And, and we see that term literacy with many topics like photography literacy. Or, you know, it's pretty much connected to just about any, any kind of a skill or discipline that you might have. And so, you know, the question is, well, what... What does it mean? And so I started reflecting back on my years uh, at Medtronic as well as at Tableau, and just sort of asked myself, you know, what what are the people? Who are the people that I've been really inspired by in the way that they work with data, and what was common about them? What traits did they have? I started just a list, you know, and then realized that I could break those up into four different sections or categories. Um, knowledge, skills, attitudes, and behaviors. I think a lot of times when we talk about data literacy, or at least when we think about learning it, right, we focus a lot of times on skills like tools. I need to learn R or Python or Tableau. And I think that that's great, you know, and certainly tools are important. They're very important. But I think that that's just the beginning of it, really. I mean, in fact, it isn't even the beginning. I think you need to know uh, many concepts first before you can apply those to tools. And then once you have tools, you know, you're going to put them into use in certain ways. Now, tools themselves are very fluid and, and, and evolving. Um, and so um, I don't think it, we should focus too much on tools, but they do matter. So as I was thinking through, you know, what it means to be data literate, um, this is actually the, the definition from Wikipedia. So the, you know, the, of course, the, the ultimate authority. Uh, but uh, Wikipedia defines data literacy as the ability to read, understand, create, and communicate data as information. 
And I thought that that's interesting because it includes a number of different things, doesn't it? It isn't just about uh, being able to interpret or consume dashboards and charts and graphs and maps and things like that. It's also being able to create your own and being able to communicate to others using data. So it's in that sense, reading and writing and speaking all wrapped into one, just as it relates to an involving data. And my philosophy here is that it's, it's to a place now where pretty much anyone in a professional context needs to have some level of data literacy. By the way, I think it's really important to specify that it's not like it's either off or on. You, you don't either have it or you don't have it. And I think what you'll see with each one of these traits as we think through them together is that, um, you know, there's various levels and degrees uh, that you can have these skills and traits. And so um, I think it's important to, to acknowledge up front, you know, it's not like you, you check a box and then you've got it. Um, so I'm really thrilled with the design of this um, book. This was actually the work of Kelsey O'Donnell, a graphic designer here in Seattle, and she came up with the 17 traits. I had some feedback from a, a colleague who felt that just showing the icons like this was a little bit overwhelming. I think it is too, so that's why it's helpful to group them. So we'll start off with the knowledge section, because I think a lot of it does start with knowledge. It starts with the kind of the facts and the concepts that you grasp and understand. And the person that I asked to um, write uh, the quote for knowledge is Alberto Cairo. I, I don't really know many people that have such a wide grasp of understanding of uh, data literacy uh, knowledge. So Alberto says who's, he's the night chair at the University of Miami. If you haven't read his books, The Functional Art and The Truthful Art, I believe he has another one coming too. Uh, but he says working with data requires a certain degree of numerical and graphical literacy, respectively, called numeracy and graphicacy. Numeracy isn't just mathematics, statistics, or logic, but a sixth sense that's grounded on a grasp, even a tenuous one, of fundamental concepts of those areas. Graphicacy, on the other hand, consists of developing intuitions and what kinds of graphs, charts, or maps are more adequate to either explore our data or communicate the main insights we obtain to other people. And I think that what I love about this quote more than anything is his acknowledgement of the sixth sense and the human intuition. And, and by the way, I think that that's a fundamental concept in data literacy. And oftentimes I think people mistakenly present two options. Either we use data to make decisions or we use our gut or instinct to make decisions as if those two things are mutually exclusive. But for those of us who have used data and worked with it, we know that there's the spark around what to look at, um, what kinds of questions to ask, what matters when we see something, where to go next. Those are all very intuitive aspects of the data working process. So I love the fact that Alberto called that out in this section on knowledge. It isn't just like you know and then apply your knowledge. It really is a matter of kind of sensing how that knowledge that you have applies to situations. So, we'll, uh, so you know, the first section here, right, knowledge, what does a data literate person know? Well, a data literate person knows basic elements of data to start with. Now, this to me is really important because if you're a poet or an author, and your language, your, your craft is, is words. And so then, you know, um, words, nouns, verbs, even letters become the basic element of your craft. Well, with people working with data, you know, what is the basic element of their craft? And this is uh, these, these kind of foundational data elements, variables, um, and there's different types. And so it's really important for someone who's going to have a good grasp of, of data to really be able to distinguish between different types of data. So for example, you might have, you know, different um, nominal variables. Those are just names that have no notion of order to them, uh, like gender or maybe if we were to poll everyone, uh, don't, don't type it in, but I guess you could. What's your favorite color? Right? That's, there's no notion of, of, of greater than or less than or order there, inherent to the colors themselves. Um, you could maybe say the spectrum has an order and that's something that you could talk about wavelength, but the color itself or you know gender, other kinds of things like that, maybe team, inherent to the, the variable itself, there's no notion of order. But you also can have a different kind of qualitative variable that's ordinal or ordered. So these are all the basic variable types, right? So ordinal, hey, that has an order, but there's no, maybe I don't know the difference between one level and another. So if you rate your pain um, on a scale of one to 10 as, as an eight, 
Well, if they were to go from eight to nine, that might not be the same jump as if you were to go from two to three or three to four, right? So, um, oops, sorry about that. Camera is, there we go. Um, one sec. That is the view <laughs> from the window, but that is live. There we go. This camera's been operating kind of funky to me. Yeah, so ordinal, right? So ordinal, it could be satisfaction levels in a survey. It could be levels of pain. Um, you know, there's no, there's no difference. Maybe it's, it's hard to know the difference. There's not a consistent gap between um, sequential levels. Um, then you can talk about quantitative or numerical variables like interval versus ratio. And, and those are different and they're all different. And so, you know, it's helpful to understand why they're different, right? An interval variable that's numerical has order and also the differences between the, vari the values are consistent, but zero has no meaning of like none. So a good example would be maybe temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, right? Zero Fahrenheit, doesn't, it doesn't mean there's no temperature or no heat. Uh, where on the other hand, ratios, these are the most powerful in some ways, statistically speaking, types of, of data types, but a ratio is going to have order, differences is consistent, and zero does mean none. Like if we were to take a poll of all the people uh, in this uh, conference and this webinar and what your height was, right? So there's such a thing as zero height. And so we could compute the notion of like percent taller or fraction of, of height. So these are the different types of, so it's really important that someone understands these notions because they matter, right? They affect how we visualize data. Quantitative variables make axes for us, whereas categorical variables make these different groupings, okay? And then when you, we go to apply color, it's very different when you apply color to a quantitative variable, you get a scale of uh, increasing or decreasing density, whereas if you apply color to a category, you just get a different hue. So it's, under, it's, it's really helpful to understand those variable types and then also how they apply. Okay, so then like, for example, if I were to say, you know, in Missoula, Montana, it happened to be 30 degrees Fahrenheit last week, this week it's 15 degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't mean it's half of anything because as we mentioned, degrees Fahrenheit itself isn't a, a ratio. So you, you kind of avoid and kind of speak uh, intelligibly to these different scenarios and be able to use data in an effective way. Um, and I'm just looking at a, a question coming through here from Stephanie. Does education and training for the data and analytics consumer start with this? Is it fair to say that a consumer cannot even begin to articulate their question without this building block? Or is the role of the analyst to translate for the consumer? Yeah, I think that you know, if you create something for someone else to consume, um, they don't necessarily need to know uh, these different variable types. They just need to be able to understand what your information that you're showing them is telling them. But if they're going to create those visuals themselves, it really is helpful and you will avoid mistakes by understanding the fundamental building blocks of these, uh, of the analysis and visualizations that we create. And so this is kind of, you know, I, I believe that is a very fundamental starting point for anyone who's going to dive in and work with data themselves. All right, so we'll, we'll cruise here. Number two, data storage methods. So a data literate person, right? Familiar with ways the data is collected, structured, stored, okay? And then what goes along with each one of these approaches. So they, they really kind of grasp the difference between a spreadsheet and a database and, you know, can, can kind, of, kind of get how those things um, affect. So I, I love one thing when I teach data at the University of Washington here. So, you know, whenever I talk about... Um, Pivoting. So this is a common topic I'm sure you come across or maybe try to explain where, you know, there's different kinds of ways of structuring data. You can have it in a summary table. Oftentimes you see that in spreadsheets. You can have that in a database form with individual records. When I try to explain that, the students really kind of, I, I, I get blank stares coming back at me. And so they need to get that concept. They really need to understand it because when you start to do things like pivoting, you kind of need to grasp where things are going, right? So like, for example, if I take a bunch of emojis just for fun, okay, and I have a pivoted kind of a summary table where I've got animals in the columns and then the letter it starts with on the rows. So you got an ant, that's the animal starting with A and then a bear being the, the uh, emoji animal that starts with B and then a cat, right? Archery is a sport with A, B is basketball and cricket. You guys get it. So then, you know, this is kind of, again, it's like a summary table format where you've got um, columns and rows in a grid. Oftentimes you'll see this data, right? As you all know, with 
columns being the years of the data, for example, maybe all of the revenue from 2017, 2018, 2019, each has its own separate column, just like we have the different animals here uh, and sports and fruit, the different categories of emoji going down the, uh, the columns just for fun. And so then, well, if I wanted to turn this into a stacked or record format, you know, I can take the one that starts with an A, okay, animals, and then I can take sports and fruit, right? And I can build out myself a little table over here, and then I can put my ant, archery, and apple as the animal sport and fruit that starts with A. And then I can just keep on going, obviously, you know, take these, these other ones through. So this is a way to explain or show to someone uh, that, you know, there's different structures to data and that's helpful for everyone to understand. But again, these kinds of concepts where you have a fundamental grasp of these sort of concepts, the different uh, ways that you can structure data and data sets, that's really helpful. And, and so also, as you then go to work with this data, understanding the strengths and weaknesses of each of these formats can be really, really helpful. Um, so I think that that's an important step as well when you uh, start talking about um, being data literate is that, you know, kind of knowing how these data st structures um, can be can be laid out. This is such a big one here, you know, so data analysis principles. So this covers so much ground um, because analysis is uh, very wide and varied. Um, the point is that you're not storing data as an end in itself, right? The point is that that's a means of extracting valuable insight about our environment. And then you need to be able to grasp the fundamental principles of analysis and statistics and when they apply. So for example, if I were to talk about the average NFL player and say to you, well, you know, the average NFL player is about 25 years old, over six foot, two inches in height, weighs a little more than 244 pounds, makes slightly less than $1.5 million in salary per year, right? That's fine. That would give you a notion of typical, wouldn't it? You'd think to yourself, oh, I know what it means to be what, what, a, what a typical NFL player is. But then if we were to take those variables, age, height, weight, and salary, and put them and look at their distributions, you see there, those are the four distributions shown to the left. And they're very, very different, right? One of them is more or less Gaussian. That's the top left, okay? One is like a, a skewed right, so sort of like a survival function there in the top right, B. And then this one in the bottom left here, C, is really almost trimodal. It's a very funky shape. And then on the right hand side there in the bottom is, is this, you know, a, a, basically a power law function with an incredibly long tail of very extremely high values relative to the rest of the data set. So that makes a big difference. You know, average in the context of these different distribution types is totally different, right? So kind of, can you guess um, which, which of them, what's A? What do you think A is? Is it, is it uh, their, their age, their height, their weight, or their salary? So let's take a look. So A is actually, that's their height. So it's actually pretty Gaussian, right? Most NFL players fit within a pretty normal uh, distribution of height. B is their age. So you see a handful of players that are um, quite a bit older than the rest. And there's a uh, really um, cliff drop off to the left there because, you know, with the NFL, I think you the rule is you have to have played college for two years or something like that, right? So there's kind of like effectively a minimum age for the league. And then this one in the bottom left this is the funny one here. This is weight. So you've got kind of different groupings of players based on where they play. You know, you get the speedy, lightweight players. You've got the play, you know, that run the field, like the wide receivers and, and so forth. And you've got the heavier players on the line. So there's different groupings there. And then obviously this one over here, it's very unique is a salary. And oftentimes we do find economic variables have this sort of power law distribution so that you, know, you do see uh, variables that have, or uh, records in the data that have just order of magnitude higher salary or uh, home price, things like that. Um, and so then average, right, is, uh, is very tricky because those high values pull the average high. But this is a good thing to understand, right? And then we start diving into using things like average and, and median and standard deviation. And they have different meanings in these different, the, the distributions matter quite a lot. All right, number four is this is an important one because eventually we're going to be visualizing data, right? That's a hugely powerful thing that we can do is taking data and visualizing it. The human visual system is a very high bandwidth channel to the brain. This is a quote from um, Tamara Munzner's book, Visualization Analysis and Design. So the data literate person is going to understand, you know, how to take data and visualize it 
the respective pros and cons of these different kinds of, of um, encodings, mappings and aesthetics, uh, chart types, when they're effective, what they're effective to do, what they're less effective with, right? And, and then just understanding how their audience is going to be um, kind of uh, understanding what they're showing to them in visual form. So I love this one. Uh, this is what I show when I, when I teach my class. I say, if I could only have one slide to teach a data visualization theory class, I picked this one and it's right out of Munzner's book there, which you can see visualization analysis and design. And what I love about it is that she's taken the different channels of encodings. And on the left-hand side, you have your magnitude channels on the, or you know, quantitative. On the right-hand side, you have these categorical attributes. And at the top, you have the most effective encoding types. And effective is defined by the ability of your audience to um, come up with a, a, an accurate understanding of the, the relationship with, uh, with respect to the data that's being shown. So, you know, it's easy, for example, when you have a position on a common scale to be able to say if one of those deeds is twice or three times farther along or half as half again as far along. Okay, and then as you go down, these different encoding types become more and more challenging to be accurate uh, as, as an audience. So these are really important concepts to grasp as we uh, choose how we're going to visualize our data. So this is an important aspect of data literacy is, is knowing these encodings and when to use which one. It's not to say you only use one at the top, right? Oftentimes you're going to do uh, multiple encodings and you want to uh, make use of those channels lower down for maybe less salient variables and such. Okay, so this is a super powerful concept. I think data visualization over the last half decade or so has really risen in prominence to being a, uh, a topic of, of interest to many people. And there's so many great resources out there on the topic. And again, I would, I would definitely refer you to Munzner's book. So that's it for the knowledge section here. So this next, I asked a, a friend of mine, RJ, to give the quote for the skills section. So if you've ever seen RJ's website, infoetrust.com, he has some pretty amazing data stories that he tells. And um, there we go. It's like it's timing out or something. And uh, so you can watch it. We call it data shorts. They're really amazing kinds of, um, kind of stories that he's telling. And it requires a whole variety of, of tools and skills. And so his, his skill set was so amazing that I thought, hey, RJ would be a great person to write the quote for the skill section. And so he says, exploratory analysis expands your personal knowledge, probing generates insights and produces visual artifacts that document what the data has to show. As you begin to understand the data, a new sense of what is emerges. You note that some views might also help others see what you've learned. You search for even better forms for conveying those insights, and now you turn your attention to focusing on the story to the audience. So this is this whole process, right, of kind of going through this exploratory um, phase, and then you kind of go, you know, come across insights and then want to communicate them. And each one of those phases and steps involves skills and tools. Well, I'm actually kind of excited to let you know that actually RJ is on the call with us. So, hey, RJ, how you doing? I'm doing great, Ben. All right, awesome. Well, hey, um, maybe you could tell the folks on the call here all about your book, which is about to be published, right? It's available. Tell us a little bit about it. Absolutely. So, um, can you hear me okay? I can, yeah. Okay, great. So Info we, is your RJ okay? Info we Trust is coming out tomorrow. Um, tomorrow. And I'm so, I'm so excited for all of you um, to hold this book, to see this book, and, and most importantly, to experience this book because this book is really a multi-sensory journey, a multi-sensory voyage. It's, um, it's packed with a thrilling narrative adventure uh, through data storytelling, the craft of data storytelling, um, but then it also is accompanied by over 300 hand-drawn illustrations. Uh, it's hardcover, it's full color, it's just a really beautiful book that's the perfect size and the perfect feel um, uh, to just really sort of like snuggle up with it and enjoy it because it, it really is just a, a real delight and I've been working for the last couple of years uh, to make it for all of you. And I'm just so excited for you to experience it. So Ben, if we, maybe we can go to my, my camera on the big screen and I'll, I'll just show people a little bit about what we're talking about in terms of skills. Is that, is that possible? Yeah. Let me give it a shot here. Hold on. Escape. So this, um, oh, hold on. 
Share we go. Okay, there you go. I think I think everybody should be able to see you now. I think I have you really big. I don't know if maybe that's just me. Um, but this book has, um, I'll give just a, a, a quick preview of one thing related to skills, which is a little um, pictorial metaphor I like to use. And let me see if I hold this up like this. Can everybody see that? That should be maybe in focus. Does that make sense, Ben? Yeah, we can see it great. All right, so you have two lenses here and you have, um, you have a, a diverging lens. And what that does is it, it takes input material such as data and you take that data and as you explore it, you start generating, you start generating pictures, you start generating information. And as you generate more and more pictures, more and more information, your sense of what the data has to tell, what the data has to show, um, expands. And then at a certain point, you sort of have the insight, you have a discovery, you have some sort of learning, or maybe you just run out of time, but it's time to sort of leave that phase, collect all of those visual artifacts, and then focus those using the second lens to your audience. And so when I, when I think about our work, there's sort of this, this internal, some people call exploratory data analysis, but there's this very personal investigation, it's, uh, often very sort of high energy, and it's sort of you're doing the work for you. Um, but then at a certain point, your attention has to turn away from looking inside and your attention has to turn towards who are you informing. And the book, Info We Trust, you know, info can mean a lot of things. Info can mean information, but info can also mean informing. And informing is really what's important because information, what's information? Information is maps, charts, diagrams, and I love making all those things. Those are, those are all wonderful things. But if no people actually interact with those things, then the maps and charts and diagrams, they just collect dust on a shelf. And so what we're really concerned with is informing. And so our focus is really on who is our audience and how can we inform the story going on inside of their head uh, and how they, how they think about the world, how they understand the world, how they understand reality. Um, and so it's a, it's a really great privilege to be a data storyteller and to uh, have an opportunity to impact, you know, through data and through information, how people are informed, how they think about the world. Um, so the book is Info We Trust. Again, I can't wait for you, everybody to, uh, to read it. Um, I am, you know, I'll, I'll look at the chat and Q&A right now for a little bit. But beyond that, I'm on Twitter and my DMs are open. If you want to find me, uh, the handle is at Info We Trust. Thanks so much, Ben. Yeah, thank you, RJ. So it looks like a couple questions here coming through. So is it a- Sure, at, at, Amazon? any I should answer live, do you think? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Can, so if anybody has a couple questions for RJ, go ahead and um, send them through now. So one question is, is it available on Amazon? Yeah, so um, the book is definitely available on Amazon. And uh, I've learned a lot about publishing across the last few months. And basically, Amazon sells the book uh, essentially at a loss before it's published. So I expect that today is the last day to get it so cheap. It's 43% off right now. I think it's 22 or $23, um, you know, to get this book. So today, if you go to Amazon, um, you know, if you, and you want a deal on the book, today is the day to get that deal. And, uh, again, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a really gorgeous artifact and, um, I've been working for years on it to make it to make it this beautiful. So I'm sure you're going to get more than $22 worth of delight out of it. Awesome, yeah, and Max uh, just put the link in there too, which is cool, so yeah, now's the time. Sounds like today's the day to get it. Uh, RJ, we had a conference down in Miami a few uh, a couple months ago, and uh, he was generous enough to send everybody that was at that conference a free copy, so I'm waiting eagerly for mine to come through. Yeah, it's just, I mean, just the amount of uh, care you put into this craft, I think to me is a very inspirational thing. So, Hey, I know it was a labor of love. I know you had to kind of sequester yourself for many, many months to get it done, but, uh, thank you for doing that. And I think I know we're all looking forward to reading it. So, and thanks Absolutely. for the quote for the ebook here, RJ. Um, like I said, you know, just like, who's the person I know that has the widest uh, array of skills and you're the first person I thought of. So we'll let you drop off. I know you mentioned you had to go. So thanks for your time and for joining us. And, uh, 
all the best. Good luck with the book and looking forward to seeing, um, you know, you do, you do many things with, the, with this. Do you have any, um, like, ch um, a book tour or anything like that where can people uh, hear you next? Yeah, so, so uh, I will be traveling around a little bit. I'm going to start here in the Bay Area. Um, eventually, once sort of the blizzards cool down, I'll go to the East Coast, but that probably won't be until the springtime. Uh, the best way to follow me is is on Twitter. Again, the handle is info we trust. At info we trust. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks, RJ. Awesome. Let's get back to the the seventeen traits here. So we are on uh, skills. So we got to kind of hustle here because we're about halfway into the conference and webinar, and we've got thirteen more to go. So let me share my screen here again. Sorry, desktop two. There we go. Okay, so skills, right? So, you know, one, one fundamental skill, and I think that a lot of times when people think of data literacy, maybe this is the first thing they think of because they think it of in terms of reading. Um, so, uh, play from current slide, there we go. So one of the most important ones is, you know, the fact that you can read visual displays of data. So this is so important, right? So, you know, organizations of every type, what are they doing? Making use of tables, charts, graphs, maps, dashboards scorecards, KPIs, what are they doing? Informing people, employees, customers, other stakeholders on the status of the organization, what's going on in the environment, right? So those who are data literate know how to be able, need to know how to be able to read and understand those visual displays of data. So when you see a dashboard showing the population of the earth and, and how it's growing, you know, understanding what this is telling you and being able to discern, you know, different things about uh, the topic is, is a, a, such an important skill reading data, right? Reading charts, reading visuals is really critical. And it's something that we all have to do day in and day out. I mean, it feels like a, a day does not go by when we don't see some type of, whether it's, you know, could be not just at our work, right? I mean, it could be in the news, we're looking at polling numbers or, you know, census data. Um, in our own personal lives, we're checking out what's going on with our health or maybe our, our budget and finances, right? So we're, we're constantly these days in apps, in websites, on TV still, presented with visual displays of data. So being able to interrogate those and being able to figure out what they mean, understanding ways that people can build in interactivity so that we can make use of it as consumers of data. It really, you know, that, that's kind of a fundamental piece. I think for a lot of people who are data phobic, which is the term that I've been thinking a lot about lately, there are people that really do feel, you know, afraid. They didn't really see themselves maybe as math people or they heard that story growing up that this isn't for them. I don't know. I think it's too bad that they felt that they heard those messages, by the way. That's another story. But I do think that people are intimidated by visual displays of data. I know that many are. Not everyone, but many are. And so this is a good starting point because it uses their intuitive notion of comparing things, length, size, color, right? That's an intuitive aspect of each one of us. And we all inherently speak that language. Um, when, when it comes to all the cognitive psychology and, and around things like pre-attentive attributes. So being able to read visual displays of data, hey, that's so, so important. I think that there's a whole program in and of itself right there. But I, I, I'm very, I feel very strongly that it needs to go beyond that. Because the problem, I think, is that if all you're doing, and if data literacy to you just means reading other people's visuals, there can be a lot going on there behind and underneath the surface level that you need to be able to understand as well to be able to figure out what's going on, to not be misled, to uh, take a visual and be able to, to, to break it apart, right? Because it's so easy to deceive or mislead, whether it's intentional or, or mistaken. It's very easy to show someone something that uh, is misleading. And, and oftentimes you need to be able to get your hands in the data itself to be able to figure out what's going on there. I just think of all the times I've misled myself with a chart that looked great and immediately I say about aha moments, but upon further analysis and working, I realized that that wasn't maybe quite as legitimate. Because you know, because every data set is dirty, right? This next step here, preparing data for analysis, it's so important. I mean, it's not a question of whether it's dirty or not and we first get our hands on it, it's how dirty is it? I mean. Uh, there's just so many uh, missing values, errors, um, formatting issues, um, typos. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that a data set can have issues that we need to be able to understand the impact of those issues 
to resolve them when we need to in order to be able to make use of the data. So this prep step is really, really important, right? It's answering our questions. It can rarely be answered by one single clean data set, right? It's most often dirty, full of errors, full of formatting issues. Relevant information is often stored in multiple places. We need to be able to bring those together, joins and unions, things like that. There's some great tools out there nowadays that allow us to do that. But a good example of this, I had a great time with a data set from Baltimore. So, you know, uh, you know, the open data portal for the city of Baltimore has uh, tow data. Okay, so they have 61,000 tow records where cars got towed to two different lots in town. And so I, I said, this has got to be a great data set. I got to download this, and I did. And, and, and I, first of all, I said, what kind of cars got towed, right? So there's make and there's model. We'll just start with the make, it's simple enough, right? How, what kinds of, of cars were towed? Well, it turns out that the number one uh, vehicle make was Honda, okay? Number two, Ford, okay? We're doing good so far. Three is Chevrolet, four Toyota, okay? Five Dodge, six Nissan, seven Toyota, eight Honda. What's going on here? Well, Clearly we can see that it's just different cases, right? We have Toyota spelt in all caps, Honda spelt in all caps. And wow, that's interesting. That's actually affecting my analysis already. Uh-oh, it looks like I've got some, some issues here, right? Well, it actually goes a lot deeper than that. So I had some fun with it, I looked at it. It turns out that Ford, it's not just Ford, it isn't just capital F-O-R-D too. It's also Forf, okay? Ford with three R's. <laughs> All right, Peterbilt, that's a kind of a, a semi truck, right? It's also Peterbilt, also Peter Butt, and Pete. I assume that's Peterbilt, I don't know. And this is all in the 61,000 records. Just looking at that one column for the vehicle make, right? There's Mitsubishi and Mitsubishi, right? There's a row called Burnt Car, which we don't know what it is, <laughs> clearly. So there's 36 ways people spelled Volkswagen in this data set. Uh, that's a tough one. It's actually the biggest one there, W-A-G-E-N. That's the right way, but you can see there's all kinds of crazy ways people try to spell the word Volkswagen. So this is dirty data, clearly, right? I mean, you think about it, this is probably a form that got filled out by hand out on the road when the tow driver's trying to get the car connected and then takes the form to the lot. They type it in maybe. I don't know. I'm not sure the process, but I'm imagining that's what's going on here. Clearly, people are manually entering in data here, right? So um, the point, I guess, though, right, is that, uh, yeah, I had a great time with the data set. It's true. I don't tell people that Valerie says favorite quote is I had a great time with that data set. I try not to bring that up at dinner parties and such. You know, every now and then I do anyway. <laughs> it depends on who's there. But, uh, but yeah, so what a dirty day. Now, if we clean it up, spend some time cleaning it, it turns out on the left-hand side, that was the original. On the right-hand side, this is what it looks like cleaned now. And we can see that. What I found interesting is you say, well, it looks the same, right? Honda's still up there, but it wasn't 5,000 Hondas. It was more like 7,700, and it wasn't 4,600 Fords. It was 6,300 Fords once you clean them all up and all the misspellings, right? And then what I found interesting was Volkswagen goes from 26 with all those crazy spellings all the way up to 11. So it's almost even in the top 10 in terms of uh, makes that got towed. So data's dirty. We need to know how to be able to clean it and prepare it. It actually affects the analysis. It isn't just a question of, um, you know, kind of, and I think at some point though, this diminishing law of returns, right? So we can probably go into like, what do we do with burnt car, right? It was just one row. Okay. Maybe I just discard that one or ignore it. I, I probably don't know. Probably nobody knows what kind of vehicle make it was. Who knows, right? So, you know, there's always a diminishing law of returns there where you can clean data ad nauseum. So a key skill is being able to kind of intuit when is the time to move on. So then, you know, then this is the biggest step. RJ mentioned to it a little bit is just diving in and exploring your data. I think preparing data does involve a lot of exploration, um, but I kind of went with this theme, right? So when you explore data, I love this phrase that a friend of mine, Michael Mixon, said on Twitter one time in a conversation a few weeks back, uh, years, actually years ago. He talked about exploring the contours of your data. And to me, that really stuck because I think, you know, to go with the, uh, analogy here of, of like discovering an island. There's value in going all the way around something. And just like that with data, being able to look at it and say, well, what are the boundaries of each of these? What's the minimum and maximum in the range? Right? Being able to understand if there's time in your data, what's the first record? Was it 
a year ago? Was it 10 years ago? Well, that really affects what you're going to take from that data set. Maybe it's just a week's worth of data. Who knows, right? So exploring the contours of your data. And I love the story. You know, many of you probably look into this and know right away. This is New Zealand, right? So there's two islands, North and South Island in New Zealand. And what I found really interesting is that, uh, so the very first European to um, chance upon New Zealand was uh, Abel Tasman in 1642. So he took his ship Zahin, Zahain, I guess, maybe you want to call it, and he discovered the New Zealand Islands. And so what's interesting, though, is that he thought that the area between the islands right there, you see what I mean, the, the kind of the, the gap right there, right? He thought it was connected he, because he didn't really kind of go through enough. And so he called it a bite, Zahain's bite. And a bite, B-I-G-H-T, but that's just a, a name of like a, like a, a crescent shape in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a shoreline. So that's what it was called for some time. Zahain's Bight was the, the, the name of the area in between. But then uh, about a hundred, over 100 years later, James Cook comes upon the same island, and he became the first European to completely circumnavigate the pair of islands. And you can tell he did a much more thorough job because he noticed that the, there's actually a waterway that goes between the islands and that they're two separate uh, bodies of land. And so to this day, that area between the island is known as Cook Strait. So, you know, that kind of to me is sort of an object lesson when it comes to exploring our data. Um, are you looking at the records thoroughly? Are you understanding the limits and, and the ranges? And are you kind of walking around the contours of the data as if you're going around a building or sailing around islands? Um, and just kind of taking stock of what's there and where, where it starts and ends and understanding then therefore what, what you can do with it. Um, once you do, when you analyze it, you know, then we know that being able to read uh, displays of data is important, but also being able to create clear visuals. This is so important. So building on your knowledge of the principles of visual cognition, data literate individuals create clear dis visual displays of data to reveal insights to others, design, craft, and publish effective visuals that their audience members notice, clearly understand, and remember down the road. Um, so that, that last piece is actually pretty important as well, right? This idea that we want to create something that's, that's memorable. And it can be memorable for a variety of reasons. It can be memorable because the data has such a, an amazing impact on the people that are looking at it. And you can also use visual uh, design techniques to increase its memorability. Uh, we know that certain things based on some research by Michelle Borkin and her colleagues show that you know images and icons, things that are recognizable, so maybe like flags, um, faces, those things tend to be very memorable, highly memorable for human beings. When you see something like that, you key in on it and you, you tend not to forget it. So there's ways we can add those sort of embellishments in a judicious way to the visuals we create to be able to draw people's attention to them, convey accurately information and leave them with something to walk away and remember. So that's a super important skill. And ultimately, as RJ mentioned, you know, this notion of communicating data. So, you know, we, that point at which you express outwardly to other um, human beings, other minds, you're connecting with them with a data um, fact or truth. So, you know, that's really a lot of times the rubber hits the road is where you're actually able to convince people. And in that sense, it's a very powerful, but also a two edged sword there in the sense that you can mislead people and you can, uh, or you can, you can, uh, help them understand something that's true and which, which of the two are you going to do. Oftentimes it isn't a matter of, again, you know, maliciously deceiving people, but rather, you know, we might be misled ourselves. And so that's a responsibility to tell stories that don't just um, have people walk away with a specific understanding, but that also are, are uh, accurate as, as, we can, as we can create them. So this next section is on attitudes, and I, I reached out to Georgia Lupi, who is the author of Dear Data, actually co-author, Stephanie Posovec is her fellow author of that book. They also put together another one called, um, ooh, there's like a, a journal workbook, I believe it's called, someone help me, Collect, Draw, Inspire, maybe something like that. I need to, I'll need to look it up, but they have a journal version where you can... Uh, do the, the kinds of activities they did where they were basically drawing postcards and sending them back and forth to each other um, that, and showing them data and showing each other data about their lives. So Georgia says every day we look at numbers, indicators, percentages, electoral maps, thinking they're the final answers to our questions, but they rarely are. No data is perfect nor objective. And if we recognize this, we can start seeing data as the beginning of the conversation, not the end. Data is already human in a way. And if we recognize it's less perfect than we think, 
then we can finally feel authorized to consider data as a starting point at the end of the conversation. It's its interpretation according to the context that matters. Data has a unique power to abstract the world to help us understand it according to different relevant factors every time. And I love this attitude of hers that, you know, we don't kind of see data as a panacea, as something that is um, ultimately and, you know, unquestioningly authoritative. It's just a lens to see our world and our humanity in that sense. And, you know, it's something that we can question. It's a factor. It's one thing to consider as well as other things. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think it really helps people to overcome their hangups with data if we just help them understand that this is just a way of seeing the world. It isn't so abstract and scary with file types and software programs and coding languages that they, they feel like they can't learn. Well, we're just talking about a way of seeing the world around us, our environment. And I think that that's a really important attitude. There's a few other attitudes that I'll just go through here as we uh, come close to wrapping up. But the question is, so data literacy involves certain attitudes, the way people think and feel about data. You know, it's, it's one thing, if you could be super skilled in all the most sophisticated tools, but if you didn't have these attitudes, I think you'd fall into a number of, of, um, of pitfalls along the way. So one is uh, an important one to me, which is uh, that I think data literacy itself is an in inclusive, it's a team sport, right? So, you know, sometimes you're just all on your own using data, understanding it. Sometimes you're working in a team environment, but, but ultimately, you know, when other people are involved, it's, it's important that we uh, believe that this is a language that anyone around us can learn to read and speak. It isn't like there's some data literati as if this is some club and some people are good at it and other people aren't and some people can figure it out and other people can't. I think that attitude is really problematic and I think that it creates divisions within uh, organizations or groups of people where there are people speaking data and it's a language that, you know, it's like a secret language or something. I don't think that that's a good way of going about it. I think that that creates many, many limitations. And frankly, what it really is doing is, is missing the boat because if you were to include other people in the conversation, give them the benefit of the doubt and do your best to try to explain things, you know, whatever their level is, okay, understand where their level is and be able to communicate with them. Then I think that uh, that's something that, you know, definitely is going to be uh, increasing the overall level of skill, right? So you're going to take what is uh, a conversation and you're gonna be able to take it to another level altogether. Uh, confidence, so there's always more knowledge to acquire and skills to build. This is almost, this one's almost an, an output really, right? Because the more you learn and know, the more confident you become working with data. But it's, for someone who's data literate, you know, being able to say, hey, I got this. There's some data, I'm gonna dive into it and I'm gonna figure it out. And there might be some things I don't know. There might be some things that I need to learn. I might be confused by various things, but I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. And I think I, and having the confidence to figure it out is a big piece of the puzzle in my mind. Um, and a lot of people don't have that. And I think that that's something we need to understand and figure out how to help them overcome that uh, lack of confidence, uh, diving into a relevant data set, you know, applying and building skills, developing new ones as needed. It's confidence is, is so important. Uh, if you feel like you can't do it, you know, you might have the most skills in the world, but if you don't, if you question your own ability or you don't feel like you got what it takes, then it can be hard to really get anywhere. You know, it can be, it can be tricky. This last one, actually, you know, I, I got to thank, uh, well, I got to thank my mom actually. So, you know, she's a writer and I, and I had the word before here, uh, wary, and I didn't like it. And actually some people that I sent the manuscript to ahead of time flagged it as saying like wary sounds like such a negative word. And so, my good old sweet mom down in LA said, hey, why don't you use the word alert instead? And I was like, yeah, that's perfect. I like it, right? So it's essentially the notion of, you know, you're um, keeping an, a, a clear eye out for things that can trip you up. And the more you get tripped up, the better your awareness level rises, right? So, and the fact of the matter is here, this I think is an important thing for us to all come to grips with too, is that errors working with data abound. There is so many opportunities to make a mistake when you work with data that you're bound to fall into one or of a number of different pitfalls along the way. And that's okay. You know, you don't want to stay there. You want to be able to recognize it and, and, um, and come out of it. This is a, also oftentimes a powerful outcome of the communicate step is that other people say, hey, you know, heads up, you know, you might, might uh, have made a mistake there. Okay, so education and experience together lead you to appreciate that they're common mistakes 
that we all, the most experienced and knowledgeable among us, make when working with data. Uh, here, here's an example. Uh, actually, I'm working on a book on this right now called Avoiding Data Pitfalls, right? So uh, this little graphic of, you know, this person's kind of cruising along and they're going to fall down into this bar chart abyss right here. But um, so an example of that is uh, the work of Edgar Allan Poe. One time I was, in fact, you know what it was? I think it was back in October a couple years ago. It was the anniversary of his passing. He was 40 years old when he died. I actually have very mysterious causes in, in the city of Baltimore. But, uh, you know, we all remember reading his books, don't we, uh, or his poems and, and short stories in, uh, in middle school and high school, um, at least those of us um, in the United States and Canada. I'm not quite sure elsewhere, but I'm, I'm sure that many have been exposed to his work. It's a very haunting piece of literature, um, very obviously well-written. And uh, one time I just thought to myself, you know, well, I'm interested to know how many works of literature he wrote. I mean, I could name ones off the top of my head, like The Raven, or the, um, the Telltale Heart, right? These were ones that stuck with me. I, I think as I sat there, I could list maybe like four or five of them. But I asked myself, you know, well, how many did he write in total? And you can actually go to a Wikipedia page on his bibliography and see all the works he wrote. And if I were to show this to you, and actually this is a default version that I created with Tableau. And if I were to ask you, hey, which, so he started in 1824, okay, when he was actually just a teenager. And then 1849 was the year he turned 40 and then that's the year he died. And if I asked you which were the years that he produced the fewest works of literature, by the way, 150 in total, each box is one of the, liter one of the different works of literature. If I said to you, hey, which were the years, thanks Bonnie, observe, collect, draw, that's going back to, to uh, Georgia Lupi's other book. Um, which are the years that, that he produced the fewest uh, works of literature? Can anybody tell me? Yeah, most people would say 1924, 1925, right? But actually, if you look more closely, you'll notice that there's actually a couple of years missing. There's nothing for 1826 right here. It goes from 1825 to 1827, and also 1830, there's nothing there. So actually, you should show it like this, 1828 as well. So there were three years that he produced nothing, and that was when he was a young man after he exited his teenage years there, right? So... Uh, this was an example where the years were being treated as a discrete variable and there was no uh, missing values showing there. There was no gap shown there. And that's actually the deep, like I said, this, I didn't go out of my way to create this misleading chart, this version here. It was actually the software's default. And so uh, I've, I've fallen into this pitfall time and time again. Uh, and there's so many like this, I guess, is my point is that, you know, we need to be alert to those kinds of things. We need to be cognizant. Those are types of, of errors that pop up quite often. Um, the ethical. So, okay, this is so fundamental. I mean, it, it does us no good to work with data, to have confidence and inclusion and all the rest and know how to prepare. To, if what we're doing at the end of the day is harming people. So uh, this is foundational to me. If we don't have data ethics right now, I and mean, we're seeing this as a big problem, don't we? We see this as an issue in our world that we raced ahead of ourselves, making all these tools and uh, data applications and, and found that along the way that wait a minute, you know, there's, there's issues here. There's privacy issues. There's ethical concerns. There's a site that I'll refer you to, datapractices.org, and you can actually, you know, sign it and read it. But they came up with, this is a, a group of us a couple years ago, uh, led by the folks at data.world out of Austin, Texas. We were all in San Francisco for a seminar, and we came up with, uh, you know, these, these principles of data ethics, which I'll, again, you can see at datapractices.org. In the interest of time, we'll move along. But another book that actually is a free ebook you can read on Amazon. You can just look for Ethics and Data Science by DJ Patil, Hillary Mason, and Mike Lukides. So they wrote a book called, it's a short, but it's only 40, 41 pages, I think, Ethics and Data Science. You can read it through in like one lunch sitting. They go through the five C's. They link to Princeton case studies where you can think through all the different nuances of these data apps or analytic scenarios, hiring by machine, for example. What are the ways in which biases come up? What are the ways in which people uh, get um, uh, you treated unfairly, right? By the, by the things that we can create and do with data. Um, so that's the Princeton case studies, which they refer to in, at the end of their book there too. So definitely recommend you read that. Ethics is so important. And just to wrap it up here, the last section is on behaviors. So we have knowledge, what you know, skills, what you can do, attitudes, how you think and feel. And then we'll wrap it up with behaviors, which is how you act. So I asked a good friend of mine, Cheryl Phillips. Now, she used to be the data editor at the Seattle Times here in Seattle. And she now teaches data journalism at Stanford University. But I'll never forget a time when I, uh, there was a bridge not far north of here where I'm sitting right now. 
they collapsed. I think what happened was a truck hit the side of it and um, it fell It fell into the water. The truck was okay, but I think the, the bridge collapsed behind it. And this is when I was running the Tableau public platform, which you know, as some of you may know is a uh, platform that we, the Tableau puts out there for journalists. And, and uh, I'll never forget, I got a phone call from her. She was on her way up to the site of this bridge collapse and already looking into trying to find uh, bridge structural integrity data. And she was, uh, we were having a chat about a project about that, that she was kicking off because of obviously what was happening. So, uh, so just a kind of a, you know, a person to me that um, kind of, sorry about that, is um, a person who really um, embodies the principles of um, data literacy from a behavioral point of view. So she says that anyone who has worked with data knows that it doesn't all come in pristine form. For this reason, a data literate person needs to learn how to handle data that needs some work or that doesn't even exist in a data form and needs to be gathered. This is often missed, but it's one of the key points in becoming data literate, right? It's this, this, in this uh, behavioral component where you go about things a certain way. So utilizing data resourcefully. So you're gonna seek out and create data as a means of gathering information, right? If that data exists, that's going to help you make a decision, then you go find it. If it doesn't, you, you create it yourself. Also continuously improving data. So you know, it's not like we either have data or we don't. That data is going to be uh, uh, full of issues that we can then uh, continuously improve upon. So, uh, as well as the, the analysis itself, right? It is always imperfect. It's always incomplete. We don't have time to get it perfect. It's not really possible. So it's always this refining step, data literate individuals looking for identifying areas of improvement in the data. And then once identified, they're seeking out ways to implement those improvements. So these are those people that we work with that are looking at ways to just take our data to the next level, make it more and more useful, add things, clean things, find ways to improve the collection processes, um, create them when they're not there. And then effectively advocating for data. So this is where, you know, data literate team members, what are they doing? They're saying, hey, we should be using data here. This is a decision we're making or a process we're running. There's something we can do here with data. And they're advocating. They're the ones that are saying, let's do this. They're, they're pushing the envelope. They're bringing it up when maybe it's not being utilized in important discussions and decisions. Proactively suggesting ways to add a data-driven perspective. So that, that's a behavior, right? And, and it, it's something that is needed in organizations. And then lastly here, I think the whole thing is, the last one here is kind of the, um, the culmination of everything because if you do all those first 16 things, then what you are doing without even knowing it, without even being intentional about it, is you're spreading data literacy in the organization. Those things together add up to an individual who is a force for change in an organization, who's pushing other people, who's helping them push themselves, who's taking it to the next level, right? This is a language, it thrives or um, atrophies based on usage. And so the people who are out there using data are the ones who are spreading it. So that's it, 17 key traits. So I'd love to know if you all have uh, additional ideas of things you would add, maybe things you'd take away, maybe ways you'd change what I have. We're out of time, so there's not a whole lot of time. Thanks for the folks that put the questions through during the topic here. Um, and uh, I do want to actually let you know, so I mentioned this on a, a little LinkedIn post that I put just a minute ago. So we've got all kinds of stickers here. Are they little stickers? There you go. There they are. All right. So I have five random winners. I just went through the email addresses. I'm a bunch of email addresses, but I went through the names of people on the call and, uh, that had registered, and I picked out five. And I'll go ahead and let them know. So it's Elena Cellini, Gary Arnold, Cody McKinney, Natalie Whitney, and Michelle Wexler. You guys win a sticker. I mean, come on. How cool is that, right? I'll email you. I'll let you know and I'll get your address and drop it in the mail to y'all. Um, so with that, let's wrap it up. But I mean, I do have time for a couple questions. Um, so here's one from Diana. I'm uh, currently in an organization that allows each department to go out and get their own type of CRM. Should organizations do their best to centralize data? Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, one of the things that I've known from my time at Tableau is that one of the reasons why, among many, that Tableau has thrived in the data ecosystem is that they kind of had this Switzerland of data approach to say, you know, hey, we're not going to force you to put all your data in one place. We sort of concede that your data is going to be in many and varied places, and we're going to allow you to connect as easily and seamlessly to that data as you can. And just speaking for Tableau, because that's the one I'm familiar with, but I think that other uh, tools may have similar uh, aspects to them. So, you know, I think it's probably, I guess maybe the answer to the question is that I don't think it's practical to put all your data in one place. I don't think it's ever going to happen. I do think, though, you know, to the degree that you can consolidate and bring together data into um, central repositories, hey, that's only going to help. I mean, it's only good. But I think there's always these one-off questions. There's always these spreadsheets floating around that we're going to get to ask. 
these kind of ad hoc uh, kinds of scenarios. So I guess my opinion is, yeah, you know, don't, don't let the need to centralize data get in your way of starting to use it. So put in place a maturity model type approach where you use what you've got to the best of your ability. And sure, you have IT pr uh, programs and projects in place to try to combine and centralize. I think if you overdo that though, you might actually find that it's tying your hands more than it's actually helping. Yeah, no problem. What are your favorite or preferred tools to analyze data? Okay, so hey, I, I mean, I definitely love Tableau. Uh, I think it's a super powerful tool. Um, I'm, I'm no longer saying that <laughs> as an employee, it, it really is. I, I think that you dive into that and it's, it's a great tool. I don't know, I always was the Excel geek before I learned Tableau, so I think that actually that's the best analytics piece of software ever written. That might be a super controversial statement, but so much analysis is done in Excel. It's really easy to get it wrong, and it's really easy to make mistakes in that format, clearly. And so I think we've matured beyond it, but I do think for simple scenarios, it's, it's powerful still. I think it's a very powerful uh, software product. Um, learning R, and I love R. I mean, the statistical um, capabilities of that tool are amazing. That's just a handful of them I can think about. Um, James Dilberto says, uh, do you always have to inform the viewer when we have to interpolate points where some holes in the data existed, sorry, or for the sake of a clean chart, like the EAP example? Do you always have to inform the viewer when we have to interpolate points where some holes, oh yeah. Yeah, that's such a great question, right? Because if you sit there and throw a million and one caveats at them, they're going to probably ignore it. But at the same time, I do think there is a responsibility to help them understand where significant or major gaps in the data exist. So um, I, would, I would think like a, maybe like a boulders and pebbles kind of a scenario. If they're big ones, we should talk about it. I don't know if we need to spend their time going into every tiny little nuance and issue with the data, right? So clearly, nor am I saying you would, nor am I saying that's what you're suggesting. But yeah, I do think if there are big uh, gaps in the data or um, when we're showing them, if we've made assumptions in how we've shown things, like if we interpolated or if we extrapolated or if we uh, made some major assumptions. I know that my work with journalists uh, taught me that and researchers as well in academia taught me that uh, you know, it's good to call those things out. Maybe it's in a, um, a methods tab or page. Maybe it's not like the main thrust, but you, do, you don't bury those things. You don't hide them. You have them there and give people the ability to do the research themselves. Ideally, they should be able to reverse engineer it and do it themselves, right? That's the goal. Um, and so um, you want them to be able to go back and see what you've done, how you did it. And so the, to the degree that you can document your, your methods, your steps, the calculations you took, I think that that's all really good. It's oftentimes we don't do it, right? Because it's like uh, we run out of time. Speaking of running out of the time, I think we're out of time, but, but yeah, um, I do think to, to the degree that you can go back or even maybe as you go along, jot notes down around the, the major steps, the big things. Um, okay, cool. So I will wrap it up there. So thank you everyone for joining our first webinar. I really appreciate it. I'm going to uh, have um, some information coming up here soon about another one. We'll be doing it in a couple of weeks, pretty much every two Wednesdays we'll do a webinar. Hopefully this was interesting and helpful to you all and enjoy the rest of your day. And with that, we'll wrap it up. So thanks, everyone.